aspects of mourning, of mourning loss and welfare. Uh, first, we're going to have Heidi Scheidel from the Pacific Northwest College of Art. Then we will have Bridget Ladke Crage from Canisius College. And finally, we'll have Rainy Billings from the University of Alaska. Thank you. Okay, over to um, Heidi. Are you there? Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. I'll start the record. I'll start the, the timer. Carry on. Thank you. Can everybody see this okay? Sure you can. That's yeah, good. looks good. Thank you. Um, oops. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name's Heidi Scheidel. I, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm in Portland, Oregon. Um, let's see. So I am studying at the Pacific Northwest College of Arts. I'm doing a, a dual major in critical studies and print media. My backgrounds are in humanities and uh, librarianship. So um, Morning Herald is an ongoing project. This is the beginning of the research stage. Um, it's primary source documentation. This is dedicated to Harold von Himmel and Mitchell Scratch, my companion animals that passed away within three months of each other in 2020. Um, Harold passed away at the age of seven last June in a, a tragic and sudden accident while crossing a crosswalk. And three months later, um, Mitchell was not grieving very well. And uh, at the age of 15, he passed away from intestinal lymphoma. This project developed while contending with trauma and it became matter to use in commemorating the lives of my beloved family members, the ones that had to take their leaves in 2020. I'm not sure how people grieve in the United States, especially grieving their animals, but if I'd have to guess for the most part, they do it quietly and uh, privately and attempt to get it over with as soon as possible. In this period of three months of my life, I became completely undone. And what I discovered while grieving was, um, it's not something I wanna get over and complete. It's, um, it's in the body regardless if it's attended to, it'll leak out. Um, so Morning Herald is experiential research. So that means it's, it's anecdotal. Um, I'll begin this presentation briefly by talking about my cat human family. Um, I will follow that by sharing some of my art objects of grief um, with homemade dictionary definitions and end in somewhat auto theoretical discussion in, in the labor involved in grieving and producing art objects of grief in a cat human family. Um, for me and for many, grief is undone, it's always incomplete and it's an act of care. So um, after surviving a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in 2000, my household and my art practice became centered on the cats I lived with and what was beginning very anthropocentric and portrait focused, it turned into collabor collaborative. Our living room floor became our studio. My cats, Harold and Mitchell were present throughout all aspects of the conception and production of our work. Surviving cancer as a teenager, uh, when I was 17 years old and I'm in my late 30s now, it made it so it wasn't so a stranger to pain and suffering um, from, from cures of things come new diseases. Um, I see my cats as compassionate caregivers, as compassion is tethered with suffering. In the Eastern conception of the word, it frames it as a state of consciousness, love and respect, empathetic being with, a sitting with suffering and the sufferer. What I describe as an ideal compassion, the type I've received from cats, it's produced through a form of inaction or wu wei, a silent sitting with that does nothing else. And I always wondered why it's so difficult for humans to sit with suffering. I know I have a lot of problems doing it myself and I have a lot to learn from my cats.
Um, as I try to learn how to sit with suffering, the first thing I needed to make after Harold passed away, um, about a month after I, I finally pulled myself out of bed and I started building a shrine, a place to sit with my cat, Harold. Mitchell was alive at this point. It became a place setting for my grief. I started growing catnip and um, a few other plants in the, the, the garden area. And I, I collected rocks and crystals from neighbors. From that shrine became a large assortment of objects. I, I realized I needed to use my body in this process. Um, I needed to keep making and I needed to um, create things to, to furnish my shrine. Um, so with my second shrine, my first one, grew in my house um, around 2013, the passing of my cat Lola. So I, I utilized um, several, several types of uh, ingredients in this. Um, there's, there's glass, tissue, paper, wax, inks, herbs, paper, adhesives, grief. Adhesive is an element that's in a lot of these objects, but you can't really see it. Um, and I'm going to share one of my dictionary definitions here. Glue verb to adhere, see glut, to glue, see clay, to paste, to, to stick, to plaster, to form, to join, to fasten, to smear, to adhere, to stick together, to bind, see adherent, adherent, adjective, sticks to, clings to, see hesitation. Adherent noun, someone that ups holds that of a follower, idea, an idea or a cause, a supporter, a support, an advocate, a fellow, a member, a friend, an adhesive substance, element, or structure, an admirer, an addict, a fanatic, a zealot, an enthusiast, a friend. I hesitate, I stick, I cling. Here are two candles that I um, did in relief. And um, upon talking to some people about this project, they, they, this looks like hagiography as if I'm submitting my cats for sainthood. And I realized I likely was doing that, you will see some anthropos, um, pomorphism. you might see it that way, or um, what I like to describe as a hybridity of our cultures. I don't know if that's okay, but that's how I feel as myself as pulling in Katniss and Katniss pulling in pieces of me. Um, <laughs> with this, I have another definition and I will show a slide of a process Relief, noun to see relieve, relieve verb, alleviate, palliate, and mitigate something such as pain to comfort, to give or allow a respite. To relieve is to free from burden, to take a load off, to raise, to lighten, to release, to lift, to let go, to hold on. Relief, noun to a figure or a form presented on a flat surface, projected from or raised above. Relief, comma, standing, out from the surface, that which is carved, molded, stamped, or engraved, see grave. Relief, as in a task, that which is achieved by way of cutting, gouging, scoring, scratching, or tearing. Relief, giving new forms by way of extraction. Relief, taking something and making incisions and wounds upon it, making layer upon layer of that which is depressed. Here are two objects of my um, engraving. And um, these were, everyday objects that I turned into art objects for ritual practices, ways to continually use my body in space with commemoration and um, the memory of my cats. Um, the first was a vase that was sent from an aunt um, when Mitchell passed away and there were flowers in it. What I did um, was painted the interior of the the glass black and incised on the outside with a rotary tool using with attached diamond tipped nibs. Um, on, on the right is my um, Herald Herald plate for shrine offerings, which I use to burn incense and put catnip on. Here is the process. It's actually quite simple. I, I drew on the base with a Sharpie and just kept going over it with my rotary tool. I have another definition. 
Engrave verb into a surface, one being hard, a cut, a furrow, a tear, to make a mark, to make a rut, to create a groove, to incise lines onto a surface, one that is hard, dense, solid, firm, breakable, unbreakable, resistant. Engrave as a task to trace and retrace, to inscribe and carve, to cut or chisel or to chase, Engrave, often holding a goal to design, to ornament, to decorate. Engrave in which to prepare a print, the darker the scratch, the darker the line. Engraving noun, a name for that which is engraved, see grave, pertaining to that which is an impression that was taken from and learned with or by the engraved. To engrave, see grave. Grave, noun, a space and a place for the dead, a preparation, an earthly ex excavation, a creation of home and a reception, a place for the dead. Excuse my cats, if you can hear that extra nice. Um, uh, a space for the dead. A grave, a cave, a tomb, a wound. Grave verb, by way of incision, to cut, to carve, to make, to form. Grave as a surgeon, incising the body, making wounds, producing scars. These are two objects. One is a ready-made litter box that was Harold and Mitchell's and um, a toilet paper roll used as a scroll, which I also call the continual passing of grief. And this is a, a woodblock print, the three colors, Harold's pedagogy. Um, something I, I learned also while talking with people about this project was how much of the act of creating in art objects and the act of being alone as in not with other humans with an animal that you love hold spaces that are very similar um they're they're places where you can be completely free and um not alone but not having to put up the masks that we often have to put up masks when we're with people um, grief, like things in, that go on in the bathroom are things that we often do in private that we do at home. We do quietly and we try to uh, pretend we don't actually do, um, at least some people, especially in American culture, the US. And this, this is kind of a, a comment on that in a way. I did a lot of this stuff unconsciously. Um, based on, I wasn't doing research on what to do at this point when I was creating these. I was just doing what I felt like my body had to do. Um, I'm going to conclude here. Um, so what I did was I, I tried to make grief material. I didn't realize that's what I was going to be doing in the beginning, but that's what it taught me as I did it. I framed it as a continual ongoing multi-sensory and multimodal sort of embodied practices and processes. And the creation of, of art objects as a memorial, as in the labor that I, I did for these objects was a labor of love. It was a labor to my grief. It was a labor to my cats, my cats that actually helped me know how and learn how to grieve, uh, things I hadn't even considered about having regret grieved, uh, such as the parts of my body that were taken away from me. Um, so why, why would people want to externalize their grief and share it with other people, make objects out of it, make mourning visible, to give it a corporeal form, to give it a body? Why share grief and make it public and outside? Um, I've been trying to think of why I did this and why I wanted to share this with other people and in a public forum such as a conference. And I also want to know, is this even a contribution to anthrozoology? I don't really know. Um, but I, I, I did collect one book on the subject um, in the beginning of my grief, which was hard to read at first, because when you're in the throes of grief, it's hard to read about others grieving. What I've also learned, it's hard to talk about grieving, but making, that was the thing that helped me. Um, I, I picked up um, 
Mourning Animals, Rituals, and Practices Surrounding Animal Death, edited by Margo DiMello. And in the end of the introduction, says, and even companion, companion animal guardians who now have at their disposal a whole host of ways to commemorate their pets still often face public ridicule when mourning the passing of their beloved companion. It's still far from publicly acceptable to openly grieve the deaths of dogs and, or cats, most normative companion animals. And as Chloe Taylor points out, by the way, this is a quote, I'm sorry, I'm reading from a book. Um, when we cannot mourn the animals whom we have loved, it makes their lives, their lived lives less real. And to make matters worse, with very rare exceptions, living with an Amazon parrot, say, or a giant tortoise, our companion animals will die long before we do. As Jessica Pierce points out in her book, The Last Walk, we know as soon as we bring companion animals home that we will have to watch them die. Their deaths then are preordained and intimately connected with our love for them, end quote. Um, I'm nearing 15 minutes um, and I'd like to answer questions if you all have any. Um, the future of this project is to collect secondary sources, to find other people who are survivors of um, mental or physical um, maladies or issues, um, not looking for a, a cure narrative. Um, what I'm, I'm looking for is learning from cats to learn how to be more compassionate and how to take care of each other. I did not teach cats how to take care of me. And by just being with me, they learned how to um, and, and helped me survive in what we call the, the litter box of life. Um, I'm gonna end my stop share. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, you'll see there are some questions and there's one from me in there. Maybe you can help me with that at some point. We'll ask questions at the end. We're gonna go on to the next um, presentation now, but uh, thank you so much. That was very moving. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so we ha next have um, Bridget Ladke Crage. Are you with us, Bridget? Yep, can you hear me? Excellent. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Perfect. So you, it's lovely to meet you. And um, so you have uh, 15 to 20 minutes starting in a minute. And if you'd like to, we'll do your questions at the end as well. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. I don't know how I'll follow that. That was beautiful. I, I was like really emotionally moved by it. It was amazing. Um, okay, let's see here. Just gonna move you guys over here. Alrighty. Well, thank you all for being here to listen to my talk. I'm Bridget Ladke Craig. I also go by she, her pronouns. And I'm a second year graduate student studying anthrozoology at Canisius College. This presentation is called, It Just Makes Sense, Using Nose Work to Induce Positive Welfare in the Shelter Environment. This is based on a project that I did last year for my animal welfare class, in which I review previous studies that assess shelter dog welfare, and then I use those to propose my own intervention to improve shelter dog welfare. So while this isn't original research yet, I hope that someday it will be. So before getting into the nitty gritty, uh, there's just a few basic principles, assumptions and definitions that we just need to keep in mind moving forward. So first off, obviously the definition of welfare is very important to establish. And the definition of welfare is actually pretty contested and debated, um, honestly. So a lot of people will use the words well-being and quality of life, which I think are pretty accurate. But for my purposes, I'll be using the definition an animal state ranging from good to bad. So just keeping in mind that it's a continuum. It's not just bad or just good. Also, it's important to remember that good welfare not only consists of the absence of stressors, but it also includes positive welfare. So the presence of good things. Many people think about the five freedoms with regards to welfare, uh, which just delineates absence of hunger, stress, et cetera. Um, 
which I think is a good place to start, but it really is only the bare minimum because it only outlines the absence of negative things and it doesn't include any positive things. Uh, so what I like to think about is David Meller's idea of uh, thriving, not surviving. Um, so it's not just about survival, it's also about um, to be a little anthropomorphic, maybe it's not anthropomorphic, but being happy um, and really thriving. Welfare can also be thought of uh, in terms of inputs and outputs. Inputs being the env environment, environmental enrichment, et cetera, and outputs being the animal's characteristics, so their behavior and health, et cetera. Also, this is pretty obvious, but an animal's living environment has the great potential to impact their welfare. Uh, thus, it's crucial to be able to evaluate welfare in order to improve upon it. So in this presentation, our setting is an animal shelter. And these are very unique settings because they do, they do great things for animal welfare um, by providing food, water, veterinary care, and shelter, um, but they also have the potential to negatively impact welfare due, uh, due to stress, um, novel situations, et cetera. So it's really important to be able to evaluate welfare and do all that we can to improve it. And then of course, animal shelters have a vested interest in improving welfare, um, just to ensure the happiness of the animals in their care and also improve adoption outcomes and increase their capacity for care. Okay, and like I said, animal shelters are, they do awesome things, but they do have their welfare challenges. Um, they do have, or they do present physical welfare challenges. So um, many dogs and other species enter animal shelters already sick with something contagious and it can spread to the other animals. Um, many puppies in shelters end up having diarrhea and vomiting. Adult dogs um, can often get a cough. Um, often they, they enter the shelters pre-symptomatic too, so people don't necessarily know that they're sick and then all of a sudden it's spreading. And then of course, obesity is a common nutritional disorder that can result in a decreased lifespan. Shelter life can actually um, often cause weight gain just due to limited space. And then they often have to feed the same diet to every single dog just due to financial restrictions and feeding whatever they get by way of donations. So that diet isn't necessarily suitable to every single dog. And then of course, another welfare challenge of the shelter environment is stress. And when determining what causes stress in the shelter environment, a better Better question might be what does not cause stress? Um, I have a whole list here. Uh, basically the gist of it is anything and everything in the shelter environment has the potential to cause stress because it's new, it's a novel situation. Um, so, you know, there's just, there's, there's a little list here but you name it and it can potentially cause stress. So because of this, it's important to be able to measure and assess stress um, since it has such implications for welfare, um, because once we can assess stress and the stress levels of a dog, then we can hopefully improve upon it. So I'll go through these quickly, but then I'll talk about them in a little more detail. Um, but the ways we can determine stress is by looking at physiological signs of stress. So physical signs in the body, such as measuring cortisol, our um, stress hormone. We can observe affect, meaning emotions and mood. We can con conduct cognitive bias tests, which I'll explain that in more detail because that might be new to some people. And then we can also observe natural and abnormal behaviors. So we will start with physiological indicators of stress. So one way to assess welfare is by physiological indicators of stress. Salivary and plasma cortisol have both been used in studies to assess the stress levels of dogs. Um, I should also note that urinary cortisol has been used from all of my reading, it seems that the results were a little bit um, less clear, but there's still potential there because urinary cortisol has been studied in so many species is obviously a possibility um, in shelter dogs as well. Um, researchers in the field often use one or both of these measures combined with behavioral observation. Um, this is important because without behavioral context, it's difficult to conclude whether elevated cortisol uh, indicates distress, so, negative stress or use stress, which is actually thought of as positive stress, more like excitement, um, something like that. So uh, keeping an eye on observing behavior just helps us put that all into context. <clears throat> 
Uh, there's also been attempts to use um, heart rate variability. And so far, it looks like salivary cortisol and behavioral measures are the most accurate. But of course, that is subject to change. Um, there's a lot of literature out there. Okay, and then measures of physiological stress actually led to a really important finding, and that is that cortisol is highest on days one to three of a dog's stay in the shelter. Um, so this has crucial implications for shelter dogs. It demonstrates the importance of early inter intervention during a dog's stay in the shelter. And this is especially useful for shelters that are overrun with dogs and understaffed. Additionally, many shelters uh, that are, or many shelters tend to focus on the dogs that have been there the longest. And while that isn't necessarily bad or wrong, perhaps doing the opposite is more critical. I should note that the decrease in cortisol over time throughout a dog's stay, it could indeed be due to habituation and decreased uh, stress in the environment, but it could also be due to the opposite, uh, rather conic Chronic stress can dysregulate the HPA axis, um, and then it basically enters a state of exhaustion. Um, so this just highlights the importance of using a combination of methods. So not just relying on one method of um, assessing stress, but pairing that with behavioral observation to really uh, put it into context and ensure accuracy. Okay, and then another way that we have of observing stress and assessing welfare is observing affect, otherwise known as emotions and mood. So observing affect is important in all contexts because a positive affect correlates with less stress and good welfare, and a negative affect can reveal compromised welfare. So this approach is important because it's the most feasible in the shelter environment. Uh, it's something that most people do naturally without even thinking about it. Uh, it's very useful and accessible, and it's also non-invasive, readily available, and free. So, for example, I mean, there's countless examples of this, but uh, some behaviors that uh, increase in stressful situations are things like paw lifting, lip licking, body shaking, yawning, things like that. <clears throat> Qualitative behavior assessments are a way to ensure consistency across all volunteers and staff, uh, everyone who interacts with a particular dog. Um, it requires some simple training and then it just consists of a list of adjectives which describe the dog's behavior, um, attempting to capture their demeanor as a whole basically, um, and assessing their positive and negative emotions. So this is just a nice way to um, give people some parameters in their description of the dogs um, so that there's more consistency um, across everybody. And then a stranger approach test um, is another way to do this or another way to assess affect. It's exactly what it sounds like. Basically, a stranger approaches the dog's enclosure and then they categorize the dog's reaction. So they often actually use the qualitative behavior assessments to do this so that there's some standardization. Um, but this is nice because it assesses emotions and mood. And then it also um, is a good way of determining whether people are a source of stress, which is really important information to have in the shelter environment. And then I should mention too that both of these methods are just a standardized version of what shelter staff are already doing. Uh, they're just assessing how dogs might feel based on how they're acting. So these are just nice ways to standardize it and ensure consistency and hopefully be more accurate. We can also formally test a dog's affect by conducting a cognitive bias test. So this is a method for testing the, testing the pessimism or optimism of a dog based on the idea that emotions influence information processing. So for instance, animals in a negative state can view amb ambiguous stimuli negatively and vice versa. The opposite is also true. Um, and this is, has very important welfare implications because mood is long lasting. So a positive mood and a positive affect can positively impact welfare and vice versa. So I put together a little diagram here so I can explain to you how this works. I'm a visual learner, so hopefully this helps other people too. Um, so how cognitive bias tests work. Um, first, it consists of several training trials where the dog is taught that a food bowl placed on the left side, so on that positive side in the blue circle, that bowl will always contain food every single time. That is always positive. 
the dog will also learn that a bowl placed on the right side in that negative empty circle will never have food in it. It is empty every single time. So once the dog has successfully learned this and they differentiate the positive and negative side, then comes the testing trial where an empty food bowl is placed in the middle in that ambiguous spot. And then what the researchers do is they time the dog to see, or the dog or any animal, but in this case dog, um, they time the dog to see how long it takes them to approach that ambiguous bowl. So the idea being that a dog that has a very low latency or they go and investigate the bowl right away is thought to be more optimistic, optimistic and have a more positive affect. Um, meanwhile, a dog with a very high latency, so a dog that takes longer to go investigate and check out the bowl is thought to be more pessimistic. So this has been done with many, many species across the board. Um, but um, with a, using a dog example, um, there was a study done on shelter dogs who display more separation related stress behaviors. And these dogs tested more pessimistically during a cognitive bias test. And this will come back. So remember this little diagram. Okay. And since the absence of negative behaviors and stress does not necessarily indicate good welfare, it's important to observe what natural behaviors the dog is engaging in. Um, it's a, this is based on the idea that the inability to perform natural behaviors due to restraint or lack of stimuli is a major source of compromised welfare. So I just have a little list here. Obviously the list can go on, but sniffing is a really important natural behavior for dogs. Playing, resting, of course, is important, but you know, I could, I could come up with <laughs> so many different examples. Um, but resting is actually really interesting with regards to welfare. Um, dogs that spend more time resting during the day actually display more optimism on those cognitive bias tests. Um, they also engage in less repetitive behaviors and they spend more time appearing relaxed. Um, so resting behavior is important to observe and it can give us important information about welfare, um, especially in the shelter environment. For instance, if a dog was previously unable to rest and now they're able to, perhaps it shows habituation to the environment and that um, they are experiencing better welfare than before. Of course, it's, this needs to be taken into context just like anything else uh, because resting can also indicate learned helplessness and or boredom. So like everything else, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. <clears throat> and then just as important as natural behaviors is observing what abnormal behaviors that an animal engages in. So especially important are repetitive behaviors that occur without stimuli because they can indicate stress and thus compromised welfare. So this is based on the idea that poor welfare or an animal not coping well with the environment results in them demonstrating less species typical behavior which results in less behavioral variability and more abnormal behavior. So some of these abnormal stereotypic behaviors include pacing, circling, bouncing, and tail chasing. Again, the, the problem is when they occur repetitively without stimuli. So a dog bouncing excitedly because a person is coming to take them for a walk, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Excuse my cat. Um, also, another example is excessive barking, which is actually one of uh, the most common abnormal behaviors, and it can be unattractive to potential adopters in the shelter environment. So not only does it indicate compromised welfare in the short term, in the present, um, but it can also have long term welfare implications because the dog might end up being in the shelter longer because of it. So my own proposed intervention is based off of several previous studies, which I will explain quickly here because I'm probably reaching the time limit. Um, and if you have any questions afterwards about these, you can ask because um, I know it's going to be kind of quick. So first of all, McGowan and co colleagues found that even a 15 minute interaction with a person can reduce stress in a shelter dog. Um, so they they did this with 55 shelter dogs. It's not just a shelter dog. Um, and these interactions, it was just 15 minutes of petting um, and the dogs overall responded positively to this. In a similar vein, Coppola and colleagues found that playing, training, grooming, and petting reduces stress in the shelter dogs. Um, this is a little bit different because these sessions were 45 minutes long, but still had very significant results. 
Also, it's been shown that daily training sessions can make dogs more likely to be adopted. Um, in this study, dogs were divided into two groups, the control group and then the training group. Um, the, the dogs in the training group were trained to sit on command, come when called, walk on a leash, things like that. Um, and those dogs were actually 1.4 times more likely to be adopted than the dogs in the control conditions. Next, um, really interesting study found that olfactory enrichment in, in the form of cloths scented with natural essential oils um, can lead to decrease in stress-related behaviors. Uh, the dogs in the test conditions in this experiment showed more resting behavior and less abnormal behaviors as a result um, of the intervention. And then finally, um, Duranton and Horowitz found that nose work sessions compared to just doing heel work with dogs um, can result in positive affect and more optimistic selections in cognitive bias tests, um, which is very exciting to me. And this will come back in just a second by way of my own intervention. Um, this is my proposed intervention. Um, so my proposed intervention to improve the welfare of shelter dogs is to emphasize daily sessions of training, playing and petting for at least 15 minutes a day, especially on days one to three when cortisol is the highest. I recognize that many or hopefully most shelters are already doing this, but I wanna emphasize the importance of olfactory enrichment, um, which may be a new addition. It's been shown that scented cloths can decrease abnormal behavior, uh, but even better would be daily nose work sessions since these have been shown to increase the optimism um, and mood of dogs. So the benefits to shelters should be clear. Um, what's nice is that these sessions don't have to be long. It's been shown that just 15 minutes can make a difference. Um, so it's time efficient, especially because uh, the plan is also to prioritize days one to three of the dog's stay. Um, and nose work is fantastic because it's a lot of mental stimulation in a really short period of time. Um, it has the potential to make dogs more likely to be adopted. And finally, the welfare benefits to dogs are very clear as well. Um, they, these methods can make them happier, less stress, give them a more positive affect, give them an outlet for natural behaviors and provide more mental stimulation. And I guess we're doing questions at the end, so I won't ask for questions now, and I am probably at my time. But thank you so much, everybody, for listening. That was absolutely fascinating. And yes, definitely questions at the end. And also, um, I'm going to send you a link where you can add your, uh, your presentation, and uh, people can also ask questions there. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Okay, so next we have a recorded uh, presentation from Rain Billings from the University of Alaska and Chris is going to start that presentation now. Hopefully. Um, Chris, do you want me to stop recording for you? Um, no, I've got it now. You've got it, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It just, it says on here that it's still recording the meeting. That's my only worry. Hi everyone. My name is Rain Billings. Apologies for not being able to present live. I'm currently living in Alaska. So you guys are watching this in the middle of the night here. I just wanted to give a little bit of background information about myself before diving into my presentation. I've worked with Killer Wells for several years so far and they inspire much of my academic work. If you guys have any questions about my presentation or me, feel free to email me. I will give my email at the end of the presentation and I'll also be around at the conference a little later in the day. In my presentation, I'm going to be looking at the ways that we mourn wildlife by looking at the example of the Southern resident killer whales. Killer whales are highly intelligent dolphins who have unique cultures that correspond with specific diets, behaviors, and languages. Every population of killer whales is entirely different from the next. Like I said, I will be focusing on the southern residents in this presentation. These guys are fish eaters who mainly eat salmon, which makes up 96% of their diet. They are made up of three pods known as J, K, and L. Unfortunately, these guys are very endangered. 
there are only 76 Southern residents left in the world, and they do not interbreed with other populations, meaning that once they go extinct, their way of life will be gone. There are a couple of reasons why this is happening, all of which tie back to the fact that their food source, salmon, is rapidly diminishing. They rely primarily on Chinook salmon. Of the salmon that they eat, 90% is Chinook. It is the largest, fattiest, and most bang for your buck snack. Chinook stocks in the Puget Sound and Fraser River area have been exponentially decreasing in number over the past few decades, leaving these guys with little to eat. Many of the whales essentially starve to death or die from issues related to malnutrition. This is what is known as a killer whale ecotype chart. This shows just a few of the different communities of killer whales that live around the world. As I stated, every group of killer whales has their own culture, which is often based around food. Many of these guys specialize in just a few prey items. None of these groups interbreed, and all of them are genetically distinct. If we zoom in on the ecotype chart a bit, we can see the two types of killer whales that can be found in the Salish Sea, known as residents and transients. The residents are the whales that I will be speaking about today. However, transient, or Biggs killer whales, can also be found in the region. Biggs killer whales only eat marine mammals. These two types of killer whales speak entirely different languages and do not interact or spend any time together. Just to give a quick note about where the whales live, the map on the left shows their traditional range, which occupies the Pacific Northwest coast of the United States from Central California up to Haida Gwaii, British Columbia. The map on the left shows the Salish Sea, the inland body of water between Washington State and British Columbia. Historically, the whales would be in the Salish Sea from April through September. However, due, due to the diminishing salmon stocks in the region, they are spending far more time on the outer coast than they normally would. Their presence in the summer is now an exception as opposed to a guarantee. If we zoom in even further, we can see San Juan Island, one of the small islands in the middle of the Salish Sea. San Juan Island is known as the Southern Resident Hub. Many whale watching tours leave from here and tourists from all over the world come here to get the chance to see the whales. Killer whales are a huge part of the history and culture of San Juan Island. These are just a few images that show how they permeate the community. As you can see, we have quite a few murals, sculptures, and there's orca imagery all over town. One of the things San Juan Island is known for is the exceptional shore-based whale watching. The whales will often gather towards the west side of the island and swim up and down the island doing what is known as the west side shuffle. They can often be seen really close, as you can see on the photos from the left, which are photos that I took, the bottom one being one that I took on my phone. I've seen them come within a few inches of the shoreline. Like I said earlier, the whales are coming into the inland waters less and less, so these types of days are very rare. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, you could see them from shore almost daily. Now you can only see them here a few days a year. This loss is profound because not only are we losing individual whales, but they are leaving a physical void behind. While typically mourning occurs in a punctuated fashion, this is not true for the Southern residents given the magnitude of the loss. We are losing an entire population that is different from any group of killer whales. An entire way of life will be gone once these guys go extinct. All of the Southern residents are individually named which is an important way for the general public, those who don't spend large amounts of time with the whales, to bond with them. Individual naming allows for a production of biography, which enables further relationships to be built. Through naming the whales, we are given permission to love them and narrate their lives. These photos are a selection of whales from JPOD. Um, this photo is from the Whale Museum, and you can see that it has their individual names right next to their photos. We can identify them by looking at that big gray spot right behind the dorsal fin that's known as the saddle patch, and it's sort of like a fingerprint for the whales. This is heavily contrasted in comparison to the transient orcas that you can see here. While a select few transient orcas have names, and usually only with some sort of visible feature that makes them unique, 
most only have their scientific identification number. The transients are often viewed by tourists as less desirable or less interesting than the residents, even though the viewing experience is largely the same for the average tourist. We can also see differences when it comes to the overall response to whale death. While the death of a resident whale will often make newspaper headlines, spur events of public mourning, and be known by the general public, the death of a transient whale is entirely different. When transients pass away, the death is usually only known about by the individuals who directly work with the whales and will not provoke the same level of mourning. This is an example of the media response to Southern resident orca death. These are both large newspapers. The article on the left is from the Vancouver Sun and the article from the right is from King 5, Seattle's biggest newspaper. There have even been cases where the news of Southern resident death has traveled worldwide. When a named animal dies, the loss is often seen as more tragic than that of an unnamed or unknown animal, as tragedy belongs to the realm of narration. The majority of the time when the whales pass away, they have been known, loved, and narrated for many years. This slide shows two different whales, Princess Angeline on the top and right hand side and Scarlett on the bottom left. Princess Angeline died in 2019 at 42 years old and Scarlett died in 2018 at four years old. Both whales were very well known. Many of the people who currently work with the whales have known Princess Angeline since she was young. They have watched her mother calves and grow into a strong matriarch. Scarlett was also well loved and was well known for her outgoing personality. Both whales died from malnutrition. Another deceased whale who acts as almost a stand-in representation of the decline of the Southern residents is Souk. Souk was a three-year-old whale who was found dead in 2012. While the circumstances around her death and necropsy are a bit obscured, it is thought that she passed away from massive head trauma directly related to Canadian naval sonar testing. As you can see, her skeleton is now on display in the Whale Museum, a killer whale museum on San Juan Island. Given the close relationships that we develop with the whales, it is highly uncanny to view her exhibit. However, this also shows just how important narration is in building these relationships and sharing killer whale stories. Unlike taxidermy, where one can see the small physical differences that make individuals unique, a skeletal exhibit is largely undistinguishable. Within the conservation world, there is a large push to share their stories. Given how much we know about the whales, it is much easier to approach conservation from an emotional angle. This is compounded by the fact that killer whales are known as charismatic megafauna. They demand attention and push the boundaries of what it means to be an animal or to be human. Their stories are captivating. This slide shows two different methods of sharing these stories. The photo on the left is a poster for a talk given by a researcher where they shared their stories of working closely with the whales. The second is the Whale Museum's Story Keeper series, a series dedicated to the whales who have passed away. Patrons at the museum can purchase Story Keeper packs that share information and photos of the deceased orca. In whale death, we can glimpse the ways that our relationships with animals change us and threaten the human non-human binary. Statements of public mourning, like this prayer flag dedicated to several deceased whales, further emphasize the ways that whales are humanized and viewed as contributing members of this community. Something is missing when these guys are gone. While the majority of community members who live on San Juan Island and even beyond into the Puget Sound region as a whole greatly mourn these deaths, that is not always the case. This article below is referring to the calf of a resident orca, Tahlequah. In late 2018, Tahlequah gave birth to a calf who passed away within 30 minutes. She proceeded to carry the calf on her rostrum over a thousand miles in a clear display of grief. The New York Times published this article a year later where they asked readers if they were still thinking of Tahlequah. While many said yes, including one reader who gave the powerful quote of yes forever, some did not. For instance, this quote here, nature, including human nature, is bereft with death and loss. Why on earth would we still be grieving the death of an orca calf a year later? This quote has some obvious fallacies, such as the clear distinction between nature and culture. However, 
It also points towards the uncomfortable nature of humanizing non-human animals. Many reject the prolonged or deeper mourning of animals because it crosses conventional boundaries of appropriate relationships with animals. Overall, the Southern residents are one of the many examples of the complex relationships that we form with wildlife. The ways that we mourn animal death often speak towards our relationships to them as a whole, as clearly seen in the case of the Southern residents. There is still a lot to unpack here, so I hope to continue studying these relationships in the future. Again, apologies for not being able to present live. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at the address above or try to catch me at some of the later presentations. Thank you, everyone. Well, that was another amazing piece. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling very emotionally moved this morning. Um, so can we hands, have hands up, please, for questions? I'd like to ask questions to Heidi first. If that's okay, Tom, you've got your um, your hand up. Hand is down. Does anybody have questions for Heidi at the moment? If not, um, uh, Jess had a question in the chat for Heidi. Jess, do you want to ask the question? Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. So, I mean, all three talks were fascinating. Um, I think it's amazing, isn't it, how many different species can be in one um, one session. Um, but yeah, so my question to Heidi was, given that we live in quite an anthropocentric society um, across the world, particularly in the West, uh, for lack of a better word, um, have you ever encountered um, different responses or even negative responses to your work about mourning the loss of a companion animal? Um, that's actually a difficult question. <laughs> I, 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 I live a lot of my life in isolation and when I do enter human communities I'm very very selective in which communities I enter um, and a cohort of art students and people doing critical studies, most of them have or have had animals in their lives that meant a great deal to them. So they are the main people I've shared with. This is, I haven't, haven't gone public public with it. Um, I have put, I did put one installation up when I was in the beginning process of this and it did contain the litter box. And one of my classmates said they worried that somebody walking by might think it was a joke. Um, and then I thought a lot about that and I thought maybe I shouldn't have the litter box with the toilet paper roll, but that piece was, reminded me so much that the grief isn't always about complete and utter devastation and sadness. It's also about remembering the really important things that made you happy and laugh or just like the rolling of the toilet paper down uh, into the, the litter. Um, it's so wasteful, but it was so much fun for my cats who have done that. Um, so I, I, I haven't, but I would, I'd be interested to hear what people say. Although when I did bring that up with, with my mentor at the time, she's like, well, this is just isn't for them. This work isn't for the people who don't wanna understand. And um, so <laughs> I don't know, I, I'd be interested. That's but, really, uh, really interesting response. Um, I do a bit of work myself with the taboo um, around um, feces in particular. Um, and it is that kind of people either are disgusted by it or they find it to be a complete joke. Um, and it's like, how do you talk about the, that elephant in the room um, and be, yeah, and for the message not to be lost. So yeah, but again, thank you so much. It was really, really fascinating and very, very moving. Thank you. So, side note on that, since you're interested in that, but, uh, when I was bringing up the litter box of life, somebody was using a litter box in the other room. <laughs> so it, was, it was strange. Perfect. <laughs> Tom, you've appeared. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, I was gonna ask the question I put in the chat, I, and it relates to the person using the litter box in the other room. You mentioned that um, when uh, the cats that you lost were alive, that they were they participated 
in in the making of your art. And I, I was wondering if the cats that we saw behind you as you were talking uh, participate in any way in this kind of uh, grief art. If if they um, if you if you are incorporating their actions into these kinds of actions. Um, it's a, a good question too. Um, I I wasn't. Let me think. So one one of the objects I made was um, a little box reliquary for collecting whiskers. Um, but I I didn't have any collections of Mitchell and Harold's because I've lived in carpeted environments and they're harder to find whiskers and carpet. So I, I did use Tomas's whiskers for that. And I also, he, he pre-cut the toilet paper for me because there's like scratch marks throughout it. Um, so there was that, but, but we're still um, learning how to take care of each other um, at this stage because it is, We've only been together, um, I guess, four and uh, I guess four and five months. The the two young ones. Um, so we are starting to engage in in new work together. Um, but 